you all for coming here today. I study digital technologies and cities. And what I want to tell you today is that these technologies make promises to us. They promise us that we can know the city with certainty, and they promise that we can solve its problems. And I, what I want to argue is that there is a danger to these promises when they draw us away from the messiness of cities, the messiness of urban life, um, to, uh, to focus only on the digital, instead of seeing the politics and the built environments that we need to understand when we understand cities. So to do that, let me begin with some stories. These are stories of travelers that I spoke to. I'm going to go through a series of quotes from interviews, and, and as I do so, I encourage you to think about your own experiences, uh, experiences with transportation, experiences using digital technologies, and see uh, where they are or are not reflected in these, uh, these stories. The context here is that I'm talking to people in Seattle about how they use smartphone apps to help them get around. So this includes things like real-time navigation, bus arrival apps, Uber and Lyft, and shared bikes and shared scooters that you find and reserve using your smartphone. These apps provide a lot of information, and travelers have quickly come to rely on it, to expect it. So, so let's hear a little bit of what they have to say. One uh, says that the, the ETA, the estimated time of arrival, is always necessary whenever you're traveling because you want to know when you're going to be there. Another says, I like to know when I will be there so that when someone asks me, when will you be there? I can tell them exactly when I will be there. That gives me comfort knowing that. So know that in the second one, there's a social expectation here that other people expect him to know exactly when he'll be there. Um, and also that there's a feeling, this comfort. So I call this the certain estimated time of arrival. Uh, this is a relatively new practice. We didn't always have computers in our pockets that would predict our futures to the minute. We also see this with transit apps that provide real-time info on bus arrivals. I rely on my phone a lot, so when I'm planning my trip to get to the bus stop, when I'm on my way there, when I'm at the bus stop, waiting and checking and refreshing to see how long that delay time is. I'm always checking to see, is it coming? When is it coming? I just like to be in the know. If I can count the minutes that I know when it'll be there, it gives me reassurance that, that, I don't know, I'll get to my destination on time, or I'll get there when I'm expecting to get there. It's just the expectation. So in examples like these, we see that even if the information isn't going to change any behavior, because you're still going to go to the same bus stop, you're still going to get on the same bus, um, it doesn't change whether you're going to get there on time, there's this persistent impulse to get the most current info. I asked another traveler, well, okay, what do you do when you see that the bus will be late? And she said, I stand there for the number of minutes and I know exactly how many minutes it's going to be. It's really great. But I can't imagine not knowing, even though it's completely ridiculous, I realize. There were a number of stories like this where people are using these apps not to tell them how to get somewhere because they probably already know, but because they want to avoid any surprises. Um, these travelers are, are using this, so, and, and here's some examples. So um, I won't check Google Maps before going somewhere if I've been there a hundred times, but even then I'll check just in case there's some traffic issue or a road closure, which you wouldn't be able to know about otherwise. I keep it open in the car, but I'm not using it for directions. I just want to see if it changes mid-route. Mid there might be an accident. It might change the route or something. There, there might be something faster. And even when going someplace familiar, this person's talking about walking, I use it. I don't want to walk past the place or end up going the wrong way or maybe there's a parade or a marathon or something. So these travelers want to use this information, these apps, to avoid anything unforeseen on their trips that might surprise them. And also to avoid taking a route that might be two minutes slower. Because when you have the information available, it's so easy to access, why not use it? This traveler said he could travel without these real-time apps. Um, he knows the route, he knows the bus stop, but it would be unnatural and probably stressful to not know. Um, checking this app just gives him peace of mind to know that it'll be here in three minutes, it'll be here in, in one minute. 
Uh, there was also a lot of ambivalence, though. Travelers told me, yeah, I check it, but I don't really like it. Um, so this one says, I, I think it makes it worse because I want it to come faster, the bus, but, but it's not coming faster, so I'm just frustrated. So it's stressful to not know the answer, to not have the information, but when you find an answer that you don't like, that's frustrating in a different way. But mostly travelers like this freedom that the apps give them. Um, it can solve all of their mobility problems. The, the app is the answer. Um, they were more confident in getting around the city. They expected that when they encountered some problem on their trip, their phone would be able to solve it for them. Um, one described this as just going with easy mode. Just do whatever the app tells you. Ride hailing, Uber and Lyft specifically, is, is an escape hatch. Um, with a smartphone, you're never stranded. It's, it's kind of like a security blanket. Or um, on the bus, it feels like there's no control. But with a smartphone, I can plan it with more certainty or I can wing it with more certainty. Because it's okay if the bus doesn't come. Life doesn't always happen the way that you expect it to um, because I can use my phone to find five other routes or I can call a Lyft. With an Orca card in my pocket, or that's the, the bus pass in Seattle, with an Orca card in my pocket um, and Lyft on my phone, I don't need a plan. There's always two or three options. And I'll admit that this, this took me a while to recognize how um, this doesn't happen everywhere. This is something that happens in Seattle, which is a big city. It has a lot of different routes to get from A to B, choice of a lot of different bridges. Um, it has pretty frequent bus service in a lot of places. It has Uber, it has Lyft, it has these bikes you can walk. Um, so around here, I pretty much just take the same way every day. Um, so that's been a learning experience for me to realize that this is a little bit unique to Seattle. Um, but I think that you might have some some experience of this yourself to, um, to recognize here. Okay, so despite all this new information, this new real-time information, access at your fingertips, and these new services, so Lyft and Uber and Rideshare, um, scooters, bike share, travelers still found themselves wanting more. <laughs> They've got a lot and they want more. When the app doesn't give a satisfying answer, very often the response is not to say, well, I'd better look for an answer elsewhere, but instead to wish for better apps, better data, for more certainty. Many of my research sub subjects were seniors who live in retirement communities, uh, retirement communities in the city. Uh, many of them have various mobility limitations, and so they want to plan their trips carefully. And they said they love how these tools allow them to be able to plan ahead for every detail, make sure they leave themselves enough time for bus transfers, uh, they want to scope out hills that they might want to avoid to save their knees. They use street view like this to check out sidewalk conditions before they go somewhere. But it turns out the apps don't tell you everything. Sidewalk closures and construction detours can be very difficult for seniors with mobility issues, but, but Google Maps doesn't have this information. So in this example, Google gives us a route and says you can just walk from here to here along these streets, but when you get there you see Actually, there's a map on site that tells you these sidewalks are all closed. They might look something like this. Um, and this is a real obstacle for, for many seniors. It's not just an inconvenience. It could ruin your day. And so they want to be able to see ahead. Um, several se seniors complained about this absence. They said there ought to be more current walking directions. Um, it's changing weekly, they said, meaning construction, the construction detours. Google Maps doesn't provide you this, this information. Um, you get to a place and there's construction. Another said, we have good days and we have bad days. You might have to go out even on a bad day. And so you've got to know, it would be wonderful to know in real time, what's the street view. And this, again, it's not just an inconvenience, it's making sure that they don't push themselves beyond their physical abilities. It was not just the seniors though, this theme of wanting more information, wanting more certainty, apps that make travel easier, it came up again and again. Subjects telling me about the apps that they wish they had to give them the best routes for skateboards specifically, or for boat launches for someone who just got new kayaks. They told me that the info the apps gave them just wasn't enough. They don't want an estimate of driving time for that trip they're gonna take this weekend. They want to know the future. Exactly. Is it one hour and 20 minutes or one hour and 40 minutes? Don't give me a range. So I see this as a, as a kind of certainty treadmill where getting some information only makes you want more information. These are all examples from interviews of wanting to watch the bus movements on the map or to see 
where exactly in the road, which lane the lift is in, or to know when the traffic will clear before you get there, or what exactly the parking situation is going to look like before you drive to a crowded downtown area. The certainty treadmill gives them information, but it also makes them want more. And when they want more, they're also unhappy when they don't get it. Unhappy in ways that they couldn't have been before they had that expectation. They're anxious, they're frustrated, they're uncomfortable. They don't know how to live well without it. So this is the next part that I want to discuss because uh, there's one response to this, which is, which is just to say, okay, we'll build that. We'll get better sidewalk data. We'll set up a protocol for construction closure updates. We'll build that skateboarding app. We'll refine our traffic prediction models. Surely some of that will happen. Indeed, many of it people are working on right now. Um, and maybe that will be great, but I want to sound a note of caution here. We will always need ways to deal with the gap between what we imagine and what we get, between the information or the trip that we want and what our actual experience is. This gap will always exist. This is just part of life. It's not just about transportation and apps. It's just part of life, right? And I like the Traveler study because it, it reveals a number of different responses to this gap. Travelers told stories of when they didn't have the info they wanted and they felt lost. N not just geographically lost, but, but psychologically lost. Um, unnerved is the word here for someone on a drive without her phone um, because I'm used to the blue dot telling me where I am, where the exit is, where I need to go. So in these cases, being stuck in this gap between the certainty that we want and the certainty that we get is a dead end. They, they just don't know what to do. There were many cases of travelers who just don't trust themselves anymore. When the app fails them, they don't know how to rely on themselves. So this subject is describing uh, coming to our interview just right before we spoke. The interview was at a coffee shop. It was a neighborhood that she was familiar with. It was about a mile from her home. The drive was just two turns. She said she had some idea, but she wanted to check to make sure. She searched directions and, and it confirmed what she thought. Um, and then on the way, she checked again just to make sure. So the apps are easy. The apps are usually right. So why do anything else? Why rely on your own knowledge, your own experience, uh, your own intuition, uh, which might lead you astray? But travelers are skeptical too. This is a different kind of response. Um, they do this every day. So they know that the apps are not always right. Um, and, and these are just examples of that. You know, I, I don't trust it anymore because it changes. Um, most of the time it's right, but I've been burned a lot, so I don't totally believe them. And this experience of, of sometimes it's right and sometimes it, it's not means that they have this feeling of, of not knowing when to trust themselves or when to trust the app. And that's an unsettling situation to be in, not knowing um, who or what to trust. Um, but seniors in general, they, they uh, had less trust in the app. So this senior has no faith at all in bus arrival apps. Uh, this example I love, she says, it's laughable. These young kids are, okay, it'll be here in three minutes. Ha, sure it will, son. Uh, these seniors, they've lived most of their lives, most of their adult lives for sure, um, without using these tools. And so they tend to be more comfortable acting in these, these conditions of uncertainty. The seniors' distrust showed up on Uber rides, especially where seniors who don't use navigation apps themselves then find themselves in a car with some driver who's just following the directions on the app. Um, so many of them told stories of correcting their Uber drivers. Uh, these are some examples saying, no, no, I know a better way. I've lived in Seattle 90 years. Or the way you're going doesn't make any sense. Don't listen to that. Um, they're confident in their own sense of direction, and so they fall back on the knowledge that they have. Now, whether they're right or not about a certain route being faster, I, I don't know. They might be, they might not be. But that's not the point. The point is that they have resources other than digitality, other than the apps, for finding their way through a situation. And so they're better prepared for dealing with this gap, this inevitable gap. So there's a desire to know, and the apps promise to satisfy this desire. Um, travelers want certainty about their trips, um, and they're sometimes anxious without it. Um, and, and apps sometimes provide this certainty, and they sometimes don't. Inevitably, they, the apps cannot always satisfy uh, this desire to know everything. 
And you can respond to this gap with more promises um, by imagining new digital technologies to fill the gap between the certainty they want and the certainty they get. But there's less capacity in, this, in, in many of these examples. And again, it's not all. It's not all of the people all the time, but this came up um, among many of the subjects. Less capacity for acting under uncertainty or for finding non-digital ways of supporting mobility. Okay, why am I talking about this? Um, I've jumped straight into all the empirical work without framing the projects. What's the point of this project? Um, what's the question I'm trying to answer? Well, again, I want to argue that digital technologies make promises to us. They promise that the city can be known with certainty and that they can solve its problems. And I want to argue that this promise is dangerous when it draws us away from the messiness of the city. Now, in that context, the traveler study is important for two reasons. One is simply because if we think that data and apps and sensors are going to fix urban transportation, then we should understand how people experience them on the ground, what they like or don't like, how it actually works. But the other reason is because I think that travelers can teach us something about how we experience the promise and the mess of digitality in other contexts, and especially in planning. So in the rest of my talk, I want to first situate this work in the theoretical context to show you why I think the promise and the mess is a useful frame for understanding digital technologies, before then returning to some uh, brief empirical examples at the end, this time from the practice of transportation planning to understand uh, what this promise does and uh, why we ought to be cautious with it, with it in the context of planning. So what do I mean by the promise and the mess? Uh, this is an answer to a question that we've been asking for many years now, which is what does digitality do in the city? Um, digitality, uh, what, what I mean by this term digitality, is just the uses of digital computers, can be hardware, it can be software. Um, digitality deals with quantification, datification, representing the world as discrete values. So that quantification, it also deals with automation. Automation is where those values can be manipulated uh, without direct human intervention to produce some outputs. And so this question of, of uh, what does digitality do in the city is one that many researchers and theorists and practitioners have been asking for a long time. Uh, what practices does it enable or change? Is it good or bad? Is it good for some people, bad for other people? How does it work? Within mobility, transportation, the field where I study digitality, Organizations like these, and, and these are all digitally focused transportation companies, they tell us that digital technologies will allow us to address long-standing transportation problems. Lime says that dockless mobility is the solution to transportation inequity. Spin says that data will make safer streets. Uber will make transit more efficient, connected, and equitable. And Lyft is encouraging sustainable travel choices. All of this is built on digital technologies, um, and these are examples of what is often called smart city visions. Um, so this is one answer that we'll come back to. What does digitality do? It solves urban problems. This is an answer that we get from smart cities. Um, a, a lot of it's informed by an engineering kind of mindset. Right on its heels comes the critiques. Uh, there are a lot of critics, especially in academia, increasingly in popular media, who see big tech in general, or smart cities in particular, as simply capitalist exploitation in new clothing. It's got a lot of political economic critiques of forces of dispossession or surveillance or exploitation. So th their answer to this question, what does digitality do, is it surveils, it exploits, it dispossesses, it's corporate, it's top down. Um, and from these, uh, this comes from smart city critiques, which is building a lot on political economic lenses, that kind of broad scale, um, broad scale view of, of, uh, of power structures. So one of these answers is utopian, the smart city, and one is dystopian, the smart city critique, but they actually have quite a bit in common with each other, which is that they share this coarse grain. They're structural. They're not interested in, in how these technologies are actually produced or experienced at a personal level, the way that the travelers told us about. They're not interested in what's happening on the ground. And there's truth in both of these perspectives, but the danger here in both of these is determinism. Whether that's the technological determinism of new data and new devices, or the structural determinism of capitalism or the state, there's a story here that these are great forces that will sweep us up. 
And if that's true, then our choices are limited to either riding the wave or swimming against the currents. I find inspiration in literature that sees digital technologies differently. One example is platform urbanism, which, as Agnieszka Lachinsky says here, sees digital platforms as not just ecosystems of, extra of extraction and accumulation, but rather of mundane connectivity and interaction. So it's down to that personal level. Work like this is interested in actual experiences and showing that technological practice is never as smooth or as simple as either the utopian or dystopian accounts would have us believe. It's contextual and contingent and it's messy. So this work might say that what digitality does is it produces relations and space in particular ways, contextualized ways, different in different places, and so our job is to trace them, to follow them and see what happens. A lot of work um, in a new subfield of digital geographies is doing this. Uh, much of it is building on this foundation of science and technology studies, which has been around for a few decades now. Um, especially actor network theory. Actor network theory is interested in looking closely at the actors and the agency that make up these broad structures of, of capitalism, for example. What does that actually look like concretely in practice? So this is getting me closer to what I want to do, but the problem here is that we've lost any political stance that we had in the structural critiques. So actor network theory is very good at describing the messy world in exhaustive detail, but it's not very helpful in telling us what we ought to think about that world. Is it desirable or is it not desirable? And in fact, what is the role of desire at a personal level in directing the actions that we take? Um, what is the role of desire in shaping the tools and the structures that we create and, and how we use them? So where are the values in the politics here? And so this is what leads me to my interest in the promise. Digitality makes promises. These promises are felt at a personal level. They speak to some existing desire. Promises bind people together into communities, and so they have politics. They're a place to examine visions and values. And when I talk about promises, I'm always imagining them in relation to the messiness of actual experience, where we can see the concrete situations from which these visions emerge. And we can also see how these visions are incompletely and imperfectly realized. So let me say a little bit more about, about this big idea. These are ideas that I develop with, with Sarah Ahmed, Lauren Berlant, um, also from a lot of science and technology studies literature, dealing specifically with technology promises. Uh, there's a few key ideas that I take from this. The promise works affectively. Affectively, meaning that the promise is not an objective state or a legal agreement that can be represented abstractly, but it's an imminent experience of a certain feeling or atmosphere. So it's not rational, as so much of digitality is. It's emotional and it's embodied. So remember the comfort and the anxiety that the, the travelers described. The promise anticipates a certain future. So it's not just imagining or envisioning a future, but it's, it's anticipating, it's preparing for, it's expecting it to come. This is a way of making the, present, making the future present here and now. And what this means is that, the, is that the promise is always just out of reach. And remember the certainty treadmill, it's always just out of reach. The promise affirms an existing desire. Promises are unchallenging. What the promise affirms is not just that your desires can be achieved, but that these desires are in fact the correct ones and that you don't need to change them. So for travelers, for example, this might mean that if you want a door-to-door -door trip in a car by yourself, we're going to give that to you. And you don't need to take the bus, you don't need to want to take the bus. And finally, the promise transcends messiness. Uh, and this is just another way of saying that it's an ideal which is different than uh, what is real. So these apps give us these nice, pretty pictures of these clean maps that simplify the city and avoid the messiness of, of our actual environments. So let me spend just another moment with, with some of these ideas. Promises share something in common with the myth. Um, Robert mentioned that I studied religion <laughs> in, in undergrad, so uh, these ideas resonate with me. Uh, mythology is the frame for both of these books, which are understanding the stories that we tell about technologies. Um, understanding myth as a frame to under, or 
uh, Vincent Mosco, rather, says that we need this frame to understand what myths mean to the people who produce and believe in them and what they reveal about the society that sustains them. So we learn about our society by learning about the stories that we tell. Uh, Paul Dorsch and Genevieve Bell say, say the same thing, say that in these myths of, of tech developments, um, we can understand the ideas that, that give it shape and give it meaning. Mosco, in particular, emphasizes that Myths are not true or false. Myths are living or dead. And, and what he means by this is that there's little point in trying to disprove a myth, and we know this in our politics today, in the post-truth post era. Instead, we want to understand what is keeping the myth alive. Uh, finally, let me just briefly mention a key idea from uh, both Sarah Ahmed and Lauren Berlant, um, who have, have different books that are making different arguments, but each of them in their own way are telling us that the stories that we tell about a better life to come, the things that we hope for in the future, the anticipation of some promise to be fulfilled, that these things can be counterproductive to living a good life today in the present. Because it distracts us from the present and it prevents us from confronting the sources of present unhappiness. Because we believe that something will come soon and, and fix it for us. So I want to unpack what the promise of digitality is specifically within the city um, and how we might heed Ahmed and Berlant's cautions that these promises can mislead us. But let me just make one observation first. I hope that as I'm describing this theory of the promise and how it relates to the mess of the actual world, that this is sounding familiar maybe to some people in the audience. Because while I'm clearly drawing a lot from other fields to understand how digital technologies work, um, how data works, I also believe that planning is already doing this. Planning is already very well suited to understanding this relationship between the promise and the mess. Uh, planning makes these connections all the time between some idealized vision or a story, a narrative, about um, what our shared values are, what our vision for a better future is and what the actual practice is on the ground that is messier and is more complicated than that. So keep that in mind. Um, I, I think that one subcurrent of this, of this talk, one thing that I, want, that, I, that I hope that you take away from this talk, is to recognize that digital tools are already a site of planning. And planning, we don't often think of them explicitly that way, but I think that this framing that we have in planning can directly apply to understanding what technologies are doing. They are visions, they are plans, they are collective, um, just like our planning is. Uh, and then they are actually implemented in the world and become messy and they change how we uh, think and believe and behave. Okay, so the traveler accounts showed us what kinds of promises apps are making, um, making to these travelers on a daily basis. They're seeing these promises all the time. The apps are promising that they can tell us where the traffic is up the road, or that the bus is going to come three minutes late, or that an Uber is always nearby to take you home. These are all promises. And as we saw with the travelers, those promises affect them. They speak to some desires. They generate some anxiety or some comfort. And broadly speaking, digitality here is promising certainty and is promising solvability. Um, I think that the travelers have already shown us some of the dangers of this promise. One danger is that we don't know what to do when conditions are uncertain, and so we keep looking for information technologies to solve problems that actually require different tools, uh, especially tools that are of infrastructure, tools of politics. Um, these promises, uh, these technologies, they don't teach us how to act without certainty when we're in conditions of uncertainty. We saw this with the travelers. And what's especially dangerous in all of this is that digitality doesn't tell us its limits. It doesn't tell us that it can't do these things. It keeps promising us that it can close that gap. And, and I want to be really clear here. Uh, dangerous doesn't mean bad. It doesn't have to mean bad. It doesn't mean that we should get rid of these technologies. It doesn't mean that, that they're going to uh, destroy our cities. It just means that they can cause harm, and so we ought to be cautious in handling them. So the danger is not so much what these tools are or what they do for us, which is very often wonderful, it makes meaningful change, but the danger is that we forget what they don't do. They don't give us complete certainty because nothing can, and they teach us how to act in, 
And um, uh, they fail to teach us how to act in conditions of uncertainty. Okay. Let me bring this to some planning practice. I'm going to focus on transportation planners here um, and how those same patterns that we saw with the travelers are going to show up again in a different way with the planners. My study is focused on transportation planners and especially this world of emerging services based on new data and new apps that's called new mobility. These are the information and the services that the, that the travelers were telling us about. And these technologies and tech companies, and many planners too, are making promises. For several years now, there have been these ideas circulating about how these new information tools and the services built on them are going to improve all aspects of urban mobility. They're all pitching some version of technology addressing long-standing problems of sustainability and congestion and safety and equity that transportation planners have always been concerned with. So the planners in my research are not just accepting these pitches at face value, they're cautious, um, but they're still creating their own promises. And, in, and these quotes are just a story of, of immense change, of transformation, disruption from new technologies. Remember the determinism, this big wave is coming, get ready. And cities want to make sure that they can harness the benefits, that they can actually achieve those promises of sustainability and equity. And for the planners, the key to doing all this is data. Planners want more data to do their jobs. This is not a new phenomenon. This is an old story. Planners have always wanted data to do their jobs. Data access is essential, this says. Data is your right, these quotes tell us. I'll give you a few more examples of this promise coming from Seattle's new mobility plan. Uh, this is from 2017. And I want you to notice two themes as I, as I mentioned some of these. The first is the difficulty of action without certainty. And this is exactly what we saw with the travelers making a trip. And the second is that there's a claim that more certainty is going to be how we fix various problems. So that this, but this, this link between better information and better solutions is typically unspecified. It ends up pretty vague. The basic claim here is that our streets flow with a rich stream of data from all this new tech, and that can give us more insights. But we, we always want more data, more accurate, more granular. Here it's up-to-the-minute data on racial and social justice. I, I don't know exactly what up-to-the-minute data on racial and social justice looks like, but there's a link here between our new data tools. Okay, we've got algorithms, we've got data, we've got uh, the software to make it work. And this desire, this personal desire or societal desire to fight systemic racism. We cannot effectively manage our streets without the right data. I think if you take this statement at face value, it's a little bit frightening. Uh, we are unable to protect our communities without data. It sounds a little bit like a hostage situation. What if we don't get the right data? Because there's always going to be a, da a gap between the certainty that we want and the certainty that we get. And finally, this is telling us that uh, data can revolutionize planning and resource allocation, that we can correct for problems before they occur, but the mechanisms of that intervention, which will probably be politically controversial, they'll probably require building some infrastructure, those mechanisms are unspecified. So much like the travelers, the planners keep turning to data to seek more and more certainty. And let me give you a quick example of this um, before I conclude. So free-floating bikes and scooters. Uh, this is, they've been in the United States for about five years now. The system, uh, Valley Bike Share is a little bit different, but these are bikes that you can park anywhere um, and lock anywhere, and then you need to use your phone to then find them in your neighborhood and then unlock them. So they end up scattered all over the place and create a big mess for cities, um, but also create new, new transportation possibilities. They all have GPS, they're all sending data um, to uh, to the mobility providers. The Mobility Data Specification, MDS, is a standard format for exchanging data over APIs between city regulators and the bike and scooter share providers. This data tells city officials the specific trips that people take on these bikes, and it also tells them the current state of the fleet. MDS was first developed a few years ago at the Los Angeles Department of Transportation. It's now managed as an open source project, and I spent some time studying its developments on GitHub. Uh, GitHub is a public code repository. 
So MDS represents a core part of many planners' vision for new mobility. And in brief, this is a vision that cities can monitor and control the mobility that happens throughout the city. One example of this is data representing bike states and bike events. So let me tell you what I mean by that. When we see a bike like this on the street, MDS data might see them as having a vehicle state of available. If someone then comes and rents the bike, then MDS reports a new state of on-trip and an event of trip start. So this is describing what's happening on the street in data. So the early versions of this spec included four different possible states and 10 possible events. But the cities and the providers looked at this and they said, well, this isn't capturing everything. Uh, we need more data to capture the other things that can happen on the street. And so a later version overhauled this schema, which has now gone from four to seven allowable states and from 10 to 26 options for events. And it's actually more complicated than this because there are restrictions on how, many, uh, how certain events are related to certain states, uh, which means that originally each of these 10 events could lead to only one state, so there's just 10 state and event combinations. Now there are 79 state and event combinations that are allowed to be reported, uh, relationships that are shown in this diagram. So with this increase in the range of activity that can be reported as digital data, MDS is seeing more and more of what's happening on, uh, here on the street in these data structures. But of course, it's still missing something. The world is still messy. There's still this gap between what the world, what happens in the world and what we see in our data. So just for example, um, it, it doesn't report if someone moves a bike across the street without actually renting it. And note also there's this entire category for unknown. There's always this gap between the certainty that we want and the certainty that we get. So in my research on GitHub, I was able to see this process of sorting through different points of view about how to structure this data, how to represent different kinds of activity in data. And there's almost always a desire to know more, to try to be more creative in, in using these information technologies to solve transportation problems rather than using any other kind of intervention other than information technologies. There's this idea in new mobility that, um, as these reports say, information is the new infrastructure, or that code is the new concrete. And, and let me be clear, transportation planners are very well aware that they still need to build stuff. But I think that this kind of rhetoric is dangerous when it allows us to think that we can transform this built environment, which is made for cars, and all of the activities um, that, and behaviors that have grown out of that, into the kinds of, sus of sustainable mobility that transportation planners have long envisioned just by adding this layer of digital information. Or as this consultant says, no matter how slick your app is, no one wants to wait 23 minutes for the bus. And transportation officials know this. They told me this. But it's still, it's still tempting to forget it. Digital technologies invite us to forget it. They invite us to focus on the problem of knowing the length of the wait for the bus, which information technologies can solve, rather than the problem of the length of the wait for the bus, which is a problem that the digital technologies cannot solve. So again, MDS, bike share, real-time navigation apps, data, I'm not here to tell you that we should get rid of them or that they're destroying our cities or anything like that. They often make meaningful and beneficial transformations in our lives. I use them. There's real progress that we can celebrate here. But I also believe that it's essential for us to ask, what values do these promises represent? In planning, we know that visions are not neutral. So what about these visions that digital technologies can allow us to know the city with certainty or can solve its problems? What should we think about those values? Well, I, I've tried to argue today that the values of these promises are that we don't need to act without certainty. That's one value that this promise represents. Another is that we don't need to deal with politics, this messiness of other people who have different ideas. We don't need to deal with infrastructure. We don't need to deal with other non-digital interventions. Those are visions represented by these promises. Um, 
I'm worried about those. I think that those are, are dangerous. Um, but even if you think that those are worthwhile goals and that we should want to solve problems with data um, and to always have certainty all the time, um, we're going to need to face this fact, which is that that doesn't always happen. So how then do we learn to negotiate this gap, which will never go away, between the digital promise and the urban mess? And I, I don't think that digitality is going to be a good teacher for that skill of negotiating that gap. So that's what I wanted to share with you today. Um, thank you so much to the department uh, for uh, inviting me to give this talk and for welcoming me in these past couple weeks. Thank you to all my students who welcomed me in the past couple weeks. Uh, but most of all, thank you to all of you who are here today for your kind attention. Yes.